Welcome to this lecture on field programmable logic arrays, uh, gate arrays in the course digital system design with uh, PLDs and FPGAs. In the last lecture we have looked at uh, the, the clock tree essentially some basic related to the clock tree uh, why uh, the clock trees are uh, special clock trees are required and we have analyzed uh, uh, the basic timing of uh, data path and sequential circuit in the presence of skew and then uh, that is a kind of you know setting the background for um, the clock tree which gives a, a minimum skew between the end points and then we have uh, looked at the special resources like DLL, PLL, uh, clock managers and all that and we have started um, uh, the various method uh, of configuring or programming the FPGA. So before continuing with the, the configuration or programming we will briefly look at the, the last lectures portion and then we will get on to uh, today's uh, part. In the last lecture we have looked at basically the issue of metastability uh, for a flip flop not to get into metastability the input has to meet the setup and hold time and uh, for a data path or a register to register path uh, from that requirement we develop the inequality for the minimum clock period and we develop the condition for not violation of the hold time okay. And and same thing with the, the sequential circuit or FSM uh, where the register to register path is, is between the, the state registers expressions are same because uh, if you kind of um, um, show it um, explicitly uh, you know separate the source and destination it exactly looks like this. Now what was missing in this analysis uh, was that we assume in all these uh, you know arriving at this expressions we assume that the clock is reaching uh, at the source and the destination at the same time which cannot be true in a, in a chip um, you know depending on which way the clock flows uh, the destination could be lagging or leading uh, the source in terms of the clock arrival. Uh, so that should be taken into consideration when analyzing the uh, these expression and uh, that is what uh, we have done and we have set uh, two conditions or two scenarios where the clock and the data flows in the same direction which is called a min path problem and where the clock and uh, the data flows in opposite direction and we have looked at uh, the case where the clock and the data are in opposite direction. Then in that case uh, the source clock is kind of leading or the or the destination clock is lagging. So the available time for um, a register to register path is reduced by amount of skew. So T clock minus T skew has to accommodate T CQ, T comb and T setup. So in essence the clock period requirement goes up and the frequency comes down. So because of the skew uh, the frequency of operation is, is coming down. In the opposite problem in the min path problem where the, uh, the source um, destination is receiving a clock which is a delayed version of the, uh, the source register with respect to kind of uh, um, you know with us I mean as far as the skew is concerned and in this case looks like uh, the register to register path from one clock edge to the next clock edge we are in a better position because you have T clock plus T skew is the uh, kind of time available which need to accommodate this path delay okay. So if you analyze from one edge to the next edge uh, things looks pretty uh, comfortable because that is uh, uh, you know easier on the budget you know we, if you would have fixed the clock period or something then here is a relaxation on the clock period so which is good in a way. But the real danger as I said is that um, since the clock is getting skewed 
may be this uh, the if this the data path is fast then it can violate the whole time because the clock is moving ahead and if the TCO and TCOM is min then it can violate the whole time. So that is what is shown here TCO min plus TCOM min uh, should be greater than the TSQ max and T hold. So you, if it is not so it can violate and if there is a violation happens um, kind of reducing the clock frequency uh, is of no use okay. Because in the earlier problem um, we sorted out suppose uh, we have a clock period which cannot accommodate uh, this kind of um, uh, skew then we can reduce the clock period. But in a min bath problem um, it is not related to the clock period at all because we are talking about uh, the same edge of the clock okay. So it between the same edge of the clock or between the edges which are delayed same edges which are delayed by the skew. So uh, the only way if there is a whole time violation to avoid is increase the combination delay or the logic delay. So in essence um, clock uh, when somebody is routing the clock in a chip uh, if there is a relative delay between the endpoints, okay wherever it is uh, that is troublesome that can reduce the clock frequency that can create whole time violation. So there need to be a mechanism to um, kind of um, route the clock tree such, such that the relative delays between the endpoints are minimal. So that like that shows you know the, with respect to earlier picture we cannot route like this you know you know that um, as the clock uh, tree goes it gets you know everything gets delayed because of the loading and from this end to that end the delay is very high. So we cannot have such kind of arbitrary scheme of clock routing. The ideal thing would be that from the clock pad uh, to any end point there should be kind of equal length of the wire and the equal number of buffers. Now this scheme does not even help even if you insert buffer here, uh, buffer here, buffer here and all to kind of offset the delays you know offset the loading that does not help because the buffer delays add to the skew. So you should have the buffers which are balanced. So it, it is ideally like you know in a simplistic way you can put a buffer then branch another buffer and another uh, branch uh, you know the in from the main route one, one more branch with the buffer and so on. So that uh, the extension of that is the edge clock tree where from the input point you know you go horizontally branch then vertically branch then horizontally branch wherever there is branching then you put a buffer okay. Now uh, that does not mean that you know this is just one end point uh, where a single flip flop is connected you know there, there could be some kind of depending on the buffer capacity there could be uh, 20 or 25 or uh, so many depending on the buffer so many flip flops are there in the in these branches in the, the last branches okay. But um, uh, like if you have a order of uh, magnitude increase in the in the number of flip flops then you branch vertically you know each one from there you can go different vertical branches and so on okay. And the idea is that if you take and from say take this end point and this end point and if you count the number of buffers up to the end point and take the length of the, the wires it will be identical. So the relative delays between the edges uh, between the end points will be minimal though from the uh, kind of the input uh, to the to the output there could be uh, you know skew quite a bit of skew which is not, uh, not much of a problem. If that is a problem then I can introduce a DLL which compensate for that kind of delay okay. So that is what is the DLL uh, is used suppose you have a clock tree which is getting loaded and because of the loading uh, if the clock is delayed and if there is a skew between the input clock and the output clock then the DLL can avoid that because from the, the output there is a feedback to the input and there will be definitely delay a skew. Uh, but how it is compensated is that uh, the T clock minus T skew delay is kind of further added into the tree so that this edge will come in kind of sync with the, the next edge okay. So the delay log loop uh, you know kind of synchronize the edge by further delaying uh, already delayed 
edge you know that is that is how it, it works. Um, uh, compared to PLL in a PLL essentially um, the scheme looks similar you know you have the input clock and the feedback clock but what is done is that the, the phase is compared and the phase difference is converted into a voltage with a low pass filter and or some equivalent scheme okay. And a voltage control oscillator you know synthesize a, a clock frequency which is which is not the kind of delayed version of this input clock frequency as in the case of DLL. But in a PLL a new uh, clock is synthesized okay in phase with the, the input clock. And that has certain advantage in the sense that um, like if there is a jitter in the input clock uh, in a delay lock loop that will appear as a jitter at the output because uh, delay lock loop just delays the clock. But in a PLL since it is synthesized and there is a filter which kind of you know filters out the minute um, jitters and uh, the clock is kind of stable okay. It is a new clock uh, it, it would not have the distortion of the input clock or the jitter of the input clock. So that way PLL uh, is better but then you know that the PLL always act you know with a, uh, kind of with a range of there is a lock range and there is time to lock and things like that you know at the beginning um, when you start up the PLL has to get into lock. So uh, it takes certain delay for the PLL to come into lock and all that. So that is about the PLL. So in the current FPGAs as PLL digital clock manager which is composed of DLL for disqueuing, phase shifter, frequency multiplication, division and this gives a phase shift like 90 degree, 180, 270 and all that. There are clock buffers, muxes for clocking I know clock switching and that has to be glitchless you know when it has to synchronize the edges. So there, there will be synchronizing flip flops which synchronize you know uh, two clock sources uh, to each other and the, all this can be connected in the clock path or clock tree path. So that is what we have discussed and this can be all these special resources can be instantiated from the vendor library using uh, the code generator tool. Sometime synthesis tool will infer from the code, sometime you have to write uh, the VHDL attribute along with the code uh, to help the synthesis tool to kind of infer what is going on and to, to kind of instantiate the correct component. Uh, then the last thing we have looked at is was the configuration or programming of FPGA and this uh, the first thing while prototyping the most uh, suitable method is uh, through a synchronous serial port called JTAG which is used for PCB testing, chip testing and all that which is used for uh, FPGA configuration also. So there will be a small dongle connected to PC which can program the FPGA and uh, uh, then there is a serial mode where the FPGA clock a serial prompt and get the data and programs it. Slave serial exactly like master serial where uh, in the slave serial FPGA expect the clock as input and the data in synchrony with the clock. Normally this works in conjunction with the master serial for a kind of chained uh, programming of the FPGA and the, the select map is a byte wide or uh, uh, kind of programming 8th or 16 bit. Usually when there is a microprocessor uh, through a parallel bus FPGA can be programmed and the configuration bitstream can be stored in the memories of the, uh, the processor okay. Wherever it is uh, located maybe in a flash um, uh, on the board and from there along with the firmware it can be stored and at the startup uh, the CPU can program the FPGA. So this shows a uh, master I mean serial uh, configuration where one FPGA is a master and another FPGA is a slave which is configured by some mode pin three mode pins are there. In the current FPGA there are only two mode pins and see this is in the master mode and this is in the slave mode 
and you can see there is a serial prom. The clock for the serial prom is given by the master FPGA. Also the slave FPGA get the clock from the master and the data uh, from the, and the serial prom is connected to the data input of the master FPGA and there is a data output of the master FPGA which is connected to the data input of the second slave FPGA. Now if you have a third FPGA what you can do is that the data out of the uh, this serial port can be connected to the data in of the third FPGA and so on and you can combine all the, the bit stream of all the FPGAs and store in the uh, this particular prom. Uh, at the beginning what happens is that the power on um, the, the FPGA start programming and or if there is a program pin is there, if the program pin is made low and you know if you if you kind of apply a negative uh, you know 0 pulse and then it starts programming any time. Uh, one issue is that uh, at the beginning uh, these FPGA has to clear their configuration memory okay. Uh, because it could be uh, not a power on programming, it could be a reprogramming of the FPGA while the power is on. So all the, uh, the program memory, configuration memory has to be cleared and depending on the FPGA type and the size, it will take variable time. So the question is that how do each FPGA knows that the other is completed the uh, initialization. So there is a init pin which is an open drain um, output which is also sampled internally. So it is an IO pin which is open drain so and which is pulled up. So it is like uh, it is fo forming a wired AND okay. Uh, if everything is high this will be high if one of them is low which is pulled low okay. That is the state of this kind of uh, wired AND uh, connection and what happens is that suppose uh, if the master clears uh, the configuration memory and it has come out then it will drive the init output high. So but if this slave is still in the init mode it will be driving it low because of this pull up resistance this still be still be in low and that uh, is also input to this particular FPGA and that you know sample that input and if this still is it is low it waits for other FPGAs to finish. So this kind of uh, the init which is an IO pin which is an open drain which forms a wired and helps uh, the init synchronization between the masters and slave. So ultimately everybody initializes every FPGA initializes and in come out of initialize initialization and then the master FPGA uh, you know start getting the data okay. Uh, you know it gives the clock it enables the clock and and you know you can see that uh, uh, the um, init pin is connected to the output enable of the, uh, the prom. So even if the clock is going unless the init goes high this chip is not chip output is not enabled so the data would not come. So once uh, the init phase is over um, the FPGA starts clocking and get the data. So the first the master FPGA programs while it is getting programmed this D out is made 1 okay. The 1 is going there so the slave wait for the, the you know, starting pattern of the configuration since it everything is 1 it will wait. So the master FPGA configures itself once the configuration is over then the, uh, the slave FPGA's configuration bit comes and that is bypassed to the D out. And the slave gets you know programmed okay and so on. Now if the second slave while the second slave programs that leaves a, a D out with the 1 and the third slave wait. So one by one the FPG gets programmed and this is a pin done pin which is a which indicates that the FPG is uh, kind of finished programming. Now again once again this is an open drain output so which is pulled high. So it, it forms a wired and again unless all the FPGA's done pin is high this would not go high. So this is an indication to the rest of the circuitry uh, like you will have uh, some like maybe a CPU which is 
uh, working in conjunction with the, C, the FPGAs in that case this down pin will indicate to CPU saying that FPGA has finished configuring and normal execution can kind of continue. So, uh, if there is a CPU it has it will kind of sample the down pin and wait for the FPGA configuration to be over once it is done then it will start you know enabling the normal operation or if there is another external circuitry we have to make sure that the down pin kind of enables um, uh, the, this, the rest of the circuitry otherwise there will be synchronization problem with the FPGA and the rest of the circuit because there is another circuit which gives input to the data input to the FPGA and if FPGA is not configured yet those the data will be lost. So, this down pin has to be sampled by the rest of the circuit and normally we can assume the rest of the circuit is maybe uh, a CPU or another uh, programmable logic based circuit whatever it is uh, this has to be taken care while designing. So, that shows uh, the a kind of very important kind of uh, mechanism to program the uh, FPGA in a chain okay in the multiple or this can be single it does not matter if there is only single FPGA you can forget about this and this works. And um, nowadays the SPI or SPI uh, based uh, uh, the prompts can be used. So, the FPGA offers uh, instead of the custom serial port SPA port and the SPA can work with 1 bit data, 2 bit data and 4 bit data. In addition uh, this PROM itself can be programmed through the JTAG port uh, permanently. So, not only really that while prototyping the FPGA can be programmed through JTAG uh, this SPI PROM not this PROM the SPI type PROM can be programmed through the JTAG port. Uh, which often when you buy an FPGA board uh, these options will be available. You can program uh, normally a SPA flash will be connected in this fashion to the, uh, to the uh, FPGA. So, that uh, you can program the FPGA through a JTAG port uh, this flash through an, a JTAG port and if you put appropriate uh, in the mode pins FPGA can be configured from the, the flash prompt all that is possible and that is what is written here uh, all what I have done is kind of um, elaborated. And the select map scheme where uh, you have a CPU and you have FPGA normally you have a synchronous uh, byte wide or uh, 2 byte wide data you know program the FPGA. And these these are the pins you know you have the program chip select write clock and data this is a synchronous bus in it down busy and all that okay. Now the issue with such a bus is that most processor bus are not sometimes synchronous okay like uh, the microcontroller bus may, may not be synchronous. So, you may have to kind of translate uh, the, the bus protocol of the processor to this synchronous protocol. So, uh, that can be achieved by a CPLD coming in between uh, to do the protocol translation of the bus and we have discussed the CPLD uh, in, the, in, a, in, in the CPLD part of the lectures and we have mentioned that CPLD is good for bus protocol translation. So, that is the scenario which is shown here where the CPU has some memory which could be flash where the, the firmware is stored. Now, the FPGA configuration bit stream can be stored here, CPU can access that read it then you know you may be byte wide one byte is read here then the byte is written there again read and write you know such a thing can be done uh, using this kind of scheme. And if uh, possible the CPU can directly write if there is a synchronous port which matches the protocol otherwise you will have to use some kind of. Uh, kind of parallel port instead of CPLD that can be done, but which can be very slow sometime when you use a parallel port in a in a uh, CPU because you have to address each port, you have to use uh, the port for clocking which can be very slow sometime okay. And that shows the timing like you know every clock edge the data is coming, chip select and write bar is low 
and any time uh, the FPGA is not writing the data it will indicate the busy signal in that case the data has to be kept for one more clock you know. Uh, so, it is like a um, kind of extending the bus cycle if the, the peripheral is slow. Uh, you I am sure that you have studied that such scheme um, uh, you know uh, normally ready normally not ready kind of system. So, this is a kind of um, normally ready system. So, if it is kind of nothing if the FPGA does not require more time then uh, you keep clocking the data every clock cycle. If it requires then uh, it indicates it is not ready or it is busy then you extend the bus cycle by adding extra delays and uh, this is a kind of a very simple scheme uh, which can be implemented in a CPLE. So, that is uh, what is uh, the kind of a crux of uh, FPGA configuration. Uh, there are you know current FPGAs are more detailed I will briefly mention it, but for vertex uh, uh, these are the main uh, ways of configuring it. Basically the JTAG, uh, the master serial, slave serial and I mentioned about SPA port uh, then uh, the select map which is byte wide which is 8 bit or 16 bit. Uh, one thing to remember is that while FPGA is getting configured uh, all the pins will be in a tri state mode. So, all the FPGA pins will be in tri state mode. So, the rest of the circuit uh, kind of has to make sure that while uh, you know they are being configured these pins uh, the status will be tri stated and um, it has to be appropriately pulled up or pulled down depending on your um, the requirement of the rest of the circuit ok. So, the rest of the circuit is sampling uh, one of the output of the FPGA which uh, normally in a default state you are uh, you are assuming it to be 0, uh, but while configuration rest of the circuit comes up before uh, the FPGA configuration then assume that one of the input is 0 if it is tri stated it can create problem. So, it has to be pulled down and once the FPGA is configured all the flip flops are reset using an internal reset line which uh, the FPGA enters does not advise. Uh, you to use as a reset you know. So, in, in your circuit you want reset even the power on reset you should implement uh, the separate power on reset than this internal uh, reset signal though there is a way of using that reset signal within your uh, design. Uh, it is a very kind of high kind of lot of uh, flip flops are connected to it. So, it is very heavily loaded. So, it may be a better idea to reset it. Uh, separately which gives a good drive. Uh, so, this I just briefly mentioned because there are uh, different uh, you know uh, kind of extended version of that vertex configuration is available in recent FPGA. So, I have taken an example of Spartan 6. It is true of Spartan 6 or uh, kind of vertex um, 6 or vertex 7 or any of the 7 series FPGAs. So, your boundary scan which is a JTAG port which can um, uh, configure a single device or like we have seen in the serial mode you can chain uh, the multiple devices through the JTAG you know exactly like uh, what we have seen here. Um, even in the JTAG there is a TDI pin which take in the data and TDO pin which take out the data. So, the TDO pin of an FPGA can be connected to the TDI pin. So, it can be chained ok. So, uh, that is possible. So, you can uh, in a boundary scan you can have a single device or a chain um, uh, you can program uh, multiple device. In the master serial uh, you can have chain you know along with the slave you can have a you know uh, you know chain of devices. Sometime what is required is that if same same configuration has to be applied to all the FPGAs ok. That means, all the FPGAs are of the same type and uh, it is configured by the same bit stream it can be connected in parallel. And now in the serial mode if you use the SPA flash uh, the data bit can be 1 bit, 2 bit or 4 bit there are appropriate pins and uh, similarly for the slave serial. I know normally as I said slave serial work along with the master serial for the chain. And 
in the select map you have 8 bit and 16 bit configuration you can have a single device or you can have a chain of devices in, in select map you can have slave select map where the clock is in here uh, the clock is given by the FPGA but in a slave select map FPGA expect the clock from outside along with the, the data ok. So, it is little more elaborate than uh, the vertex uh, uh, we have studied. So, I just mentioned so that the information is current uh, whatever I have talked about the lookup tables, logic block and all that can be extended uh, to the these kind of new devices. But this is additional so I mentioned that and another um, issue with the, the earlier FPGAs were suppose um, you come out with a proprietary design you put the configuration bitstream in this prompt ok. Now, you send that into the field on a PCB or in a product what can happen is that the power on somebody can capture the dis this data because it is very easy because a clock is coming in synchronous the data is coming. So, this can be easily kind of reverse engineered you know somebody can read the, the bit stream and reverse engineer the complete system ok because in an FPGA the main thing is in this prompt and that is kind of uh, there is no security on it the, the bit stream is coming as it is it can be easily read. So, it will be worthwhile if it can be kind of protected because mostly this will be some intellectual property of the designer or the company which is doing the design. So, what is done in the current FPGAs are that this bit stream can be encrypted using the advanced encrypt encryption scheme which is called AES using a 256 bit key. Now, through the JTAG port uh, this FPGA can be programmed with that key and FPGA can be told uh, no read back that means once it is programmed this key cannot be read back also the configuration can be read back ok. Otherwise it is possible to read back the configuration uh, for the purpose of verification and so on. So, that also can be disabled and then you deploy that in the system that means you program this prompt with a with a, a protected bit stream then what is going on this um, kind of this uh, line is an AES encrypted bit stream and uh, without the knowledge of the key it is very difficult to uh, break the scheme and this can be kind of um, a key can be very specific to the device uh, that means if a, a, a company is making an industry is making uh, say 10,000 devices each 10,000 will have separate keys not the same key. So, that way it can be very well protected. So, that is available in the, in the current FPGAs. So, there is an AES encryption with a 256 bit key. So, uh, the, the bit stream is encrypted using the bit gen tool with the 256 bit key. Encryption key is programmed into FPGA through JTAG port and once it is programmed you can configure it uh, for no read back uh, and the configuration also cannot be read back and AES key can be permanently fused like you blowing the fuse in FPGA or it can be programmed in an internal SRAM with a battery backed uh, you know. Uh, with a battery backup which is connected externally. So, one can choose those option if you permanently fuse it you cannot change um, uh, the, the uh, that uh, AES key. So, it will be permanently programmed you will be forced to use the same key for all the, uh, the, the bit stream you program into uh, to the flash. So, that way the, uh, the encryption kind of protect the design. Um, Another option available in the recent um, current FPGAs are bit stream can be compressed and which is bit older than uh, you know not that this uh, the Spartan 6 it even before the FPGAs before has this had this option. Uh, because there could be a lot of resources which are not used at all used not configured at all. So, uh, there is lot of kind of redundant information that not being programmed. So, that information is removed and the configuration bit stream size can come down. So, that has two implication one is that 
uh, you can store it in a lesser memory space and it can be configured very fast. The configuration will take lesser time otherwise for a fixed device it will take uh, you know kind of fixed time for the device is larger it takes larger time. But even in a larger device if it is not used only 50 percent is used it might take um, you know kind of less time than the full FPGA configuration. Another uh, possibility which is available is that suppose uh, you know this addresses suppose you have programmed um, a configuration here and the field like if it is programmed in a flash and flash memory and sometimes the flash can get corrupted you know. Suppose the flash get corrupted uh, then the whole device may not work uh, the flash need to be reprogrammed okay. Nowadays uh, it is possible you know you, you, you would have seen that um, earlier the, the you know the computers used to update you know uh, through the internet um, uh, the, so the, the drivers uh, the software and all that. But now you can see the set top box at your home connected to a TV um, it can update through the cable you know through the cable uh, the firmware get updated your mobile phone can get updated with the firmware over there. So same thing can happen now uh, the configuration um, through the internet or wireless network can get you know uh, can um, get to the device and the device can reprogram itself. So that is a possibility so um, uh, uh, but still you know in the field if uh, the flash is getting corrupted um, it will be a good idea if you have a kind of a golden bit stream or a fallback bit stream which may not be the recent one which may be a very old one which is stable okay. It may happen that you update the, the configuration over the internet and some corruption has happened then you can fall back on a very stable uh, version which is which is there from the beginning okay. So that is what is called multi boot and that is what is shown here in this particular slide. So um, you can have at least one main configuration and one fallback configuration and during the configuration if the CRC error like while the configuration bit stream is read the CRC is calculated if there is any bit corruption CRC will give error in that case it will fall back on the golden configuration or if the, the sync word detection is, is timed out that means at the beginning there is a sync word and if that is corrupted uh, and there will be a watchdog timer which is waiting for it and if it does not come that times out and in that case it will it can fall back it can fetch um, uh, the golden configuration uh, from a particular location and that can program the FPGA and can recover from the that particular error. And this uh, uh, scheme of multi boot is, is available only in the SPI based flash prom and the BPA based flash prom okay. So in both it is available it is a very good uh, option if you have a kind of if you are deploying FPGAs in, in the field you should think of uh, you know the multi boot uh, encryption and compression and all that which will kind of improve the reliability improve the security all that part okay. Now uh, the current FPGAs in addition to the, the DLL, PLL uh, block memory and all that you have the DSP slices which allows uh, the designer to implement. Uh, the DSP algorithms uh, very efficiently and the DSP algorithm normally use fixed point computation um, 18 bit um, Mandesa may be used. So there are uh, and you know that in one of the, the major operation in signal processing algorithm is multiply and accumulate. So which requires a multiplier and an adder okay. So uh, the DSP blocks uh, there is a Silinx FPGS DSP blocks give you this particular option you have a pre adder that means there are 18 bit tools complement pre adder that means you can do signed addition 18 bit in the pre adder and that added output can go to a multiplier which is an 18 bit 18 by 18 multiplier. So 
a uh, two 18 bits can be added and that can go to multiplier it can multiply another 18 bit which is coming from a separate port it produces a 36 bit result. Now this can be sign extended to 48 bit and it is followed with a 48 bit two's complement add a subtractor and there are various you know it is not that everything need to be used you can use this multiplier along with the post adder or you can cascade pre adder and post adder bypassing the multiplier. You can take the multiplier result outside 36 bit result. So all kinds of options are available in the DSP slides which really enables one to implement the DSP like say filtering algorithms, um, the, the encoders, decoders and so on. All that can be implemented very efficiently in the DSP slices. And many a times you just you know use the multiplier operator and then if the data size matches uh, then it gets implemented in the DSP slices or it can be instantiated and you can use it. So this is the general architecture you have uh, 4 ports uh, to all are kind of pipelined and 2 you can see 2 ports are added 18 plus 18 it give you 18 bit result which is combined with 18 bit to a multiplier this output can be taken out or can be taken to uh, in another order which is 48 bit. So this is sign extended added with a you know sign extension that output is available. So uh, this helps in, in uh, implementing uh, the, the DSP kind of algorithms and this is called DSP 48A1 slice in the Spartan 6 and in addition. Um, I must mention I have not put it in the um, in the slide but I should mention that uh, um, uh, the, uh, the current FPGAs allows you to use the lookup table as a shift register because the lookup table is normally suppose a 4 input lookup table you have 16 uh, flip flops inside uh, serving as a location. So that is connected in a chain and is available as a shift register in this case it is called SRL16 and that can be chained to form SRL32 and even higher third 64 bit shift register up to 256 bit in a in some kind of Spartan 6 uh, uh, slice and that can be you know chained across. So that is uh, you know you, you get a shift register implementation without using the, the flip flops of the, the slice because the number of flip flops in a slice is limited. And we have seen in vertex there are only 4, uh, 2 per slice, 4 in a CLB. So if you say implement uh, kind of uh, 16 bit shift register then you will end up using 4 CLBs but uh, using one lookup table in a, in a CLB you can implement a 16 bit uh, shift register. So that is possible to implement and one other important very important thing with respect to FPGA. So I am I am kind of are uh, discussing all what is remaining you know. Uh, one problem with the FPGA is that you have designed something in FPGA you have you know verified you know you have done behavioral simulation, uh, timing simulation everything but the moment you put that design in FPGA for whatever reason if something goes wrong you cannot and if it is an internal signal you cannot kind of uh, debug it you cannot see what is happening inside okay. So what is uh, done is that the FPGA vendors give you a logic analyzer circuit which is hooked to the JTAG. So now you can instantiate this logic analyzer IP along with your design and the probes of the logic analyzer can be connected to the internal signal. And through the JTAG port there will be a software which is available at the, at the tool side at the PC side and through the JTAG you can capture the waveform of the internal signal and you can analyze it and like logic analyzer you can trigger say it will be kind of crazy because uh, suppose you have a some kind of 8 bit data line you want to monitor okay. And your uh, clock is 200 megahertz and in one second there will be kind of 200 mega uh, kind of data passing over the the data bus if it is clocked that frequency then uh, to analyze that or to store all that there will not be enough memory. So you can if you know that you have a kind of um, hint saying that what could be going wrong 
but on a particular data the, the, the error happens then you can trigger on that da data and capture some data around that trigger point or after the trigger point or before the trigger point. So, if you have used logic analyzer you would have heard saying that pre trigger, post trigger, uh, pre trigger 50 percent and so on that. It depends on how much you capture before the trigger, how much you capture after the trigger and the analysis is always offline. It is not that you on a trigger point you capture some data and um, you analyze offline on the PC and try to debug it. So, it is a great um, tool to it is like once you have some complex circuit going to the FPGA uh, to debug uh, this logic analyzers can have to be used and the Silinx College Chips, Chipscope Pro and the Altera College Signal Pro and it is very easy. Now, over the years it has become a very nice tool. Only thing is that it occupies because this IP this circuit occupies some kind of space within FPGA. So, uh, if you are not really floor planning in the rest of the circuit uh, it can upset uh, the, the timing performance of your design sometime. But then if you properly design floor plan that is not a very serious issue because it does not occupy much space. So, that is shown in a picture here you have the FPGA board you have FPGA what is done is that this is the kind of uh, the blocks you instantiate like you have a ILA pro uh, it is a logic analyzer pro which is which has you know the pro points which can be connected to the user port and this is the one which is connecting to the JTAG and on the PC side you have a software which on the trigger it captures the data transfer it to the PC and you can analyze and take action you know so that is what is the, the signal probing does. So, I am just showing the vertex uh, pins you have the global clock pins which is dedicated which is used uh, which is the input to the clock tree. The mode pin for uh, selecting the mode of programming dedicated pins C clock uh, which is uh, the serial clock uh, which is uh, can be reused as a user IO program done in it busy the parallel port all that can be used once the programming is done it can be used as uh, a kind of this program pin is dedicated. Uh, but um, uh, this uh, init pin done pin is dedicated but these are uh, can be used as user IO and there is all these you know these are programming pin. And there is a this is a JTAG port which is dedicated TMS is a mode select TCK is a T clock TDI is a data input TDO is a data output then you have the internal VCC, IO pin VCC, the ground and so on. So, normally the FPGA this is a scenario you will have clock pins, you have some dedicated JTAG port, dedicated mode pins uh, and um, uh, the, um, the programming pins some are dedicated most of it is kind of can be once the programming is over can be used by the user ok. So, uh, there is one point I want to uh, mention here is something called one hot encoding uh, which is a state machine encoding which is used um, in FPGAs. Um, this is um, you see the this is the uh, the state machine block diagram we have an X8 logic which is decoding the input and the present state and or a two block diagram you know uh, enough of it. But what can happen is that we will take an example to kind of um, um, you know the to, to put the background uh, for the need of one hot encoding. Suppose you assume a finite state machine with 5 inputs 18 state and 6 output. So, when you have an 18 states it means that uh, you have you need kind of for binary encoding 5 flip flops because it is greater than 16 less than 32 5 flip flops are required and there are 5 inputs. So, if you look at the next state logic and it, it will get 5 input and 5 state variable. So, there are total 10 input to the next state logic ok. But you know that there are 5 flip flops. So, there will be D4 to D0 each of that may, may not use all the inputs ok. But we assume the worst, worst case assume that all the in some case all the 5 inputs are used less likely but then let us assume the worst case. 
So, and we assume that so there are 10 input for a next state logic and once again we assume the worst case in the vertex that means uh, we have seen that the 5 input function can be implemented by cascading or 6 input or 7 input can be implemented with 2 uh, 4 input lookup table. But we assume again worst case for the uh, you know for the sake of argument. So, here we have 10 input, 10 input next state logic. So, one um, so for one CLB can implement 6 input lookup table by you know 2 4 input make a 5 input, 2 5 input make a 6 input and so on ok. Now, when you have a 10 input uh, lookup table that means that you need 16 CLBs because you can implement one CLB I can implement 6 input lookup table. So, you need 2 4 7 4 4 8 and so on ok. So, you will end up with the 16 CLB I definitely have kind of exaggerated it uh, because uh, is not the case that all the inputs all the next state decoding will uh, require all the external input and uh, it is even if uh, there are really 10 input for some kind of decoding then that may not require um, uh, the lookup table which is 10 input lookup table one can cascade. But assume with the worst case it happens uh, one can kind of come out with such a scenario then what happens is that this next state logic is is spread in multiple CLBs and the interconnection of that make it slow. So, this clock frequency which is the TCO plus T logic plus T setup and we are talking about the logic delay of the next state logic and that can become very high and it can bring down the clock frequency of the state machine. And we have analyzed data path and we have tried to kind of uh, be very aggressive in uh, the the kind of the timing timing of the data path. And suppose if you have you know designed a high performance uh, data path, but if this the state machine is slow then nothing can work. So, not a good solution you know the problem um, the here is made by the next state logic which is very complex ok. So, the question is how to kind of reduce uh, the complexity of the next state, next state logic. So, if you look at it again you come back to the slide we have 5 inputs 5 state variables. So, the question is can we reduce this the number of state variables. So, and we have used a far, you know kind of binary encoding which necessitated a 5 flip flops for encoding 18 states. So, why not encode 18 states in 18 flip flops ok. So, while decoding instead of decoding a state you know when you decode a state you do not need 5 um, bits representing the that one state you can take one bit representing that state you know that is a basic idea. So, you have there each state is a flip flop ok. So, you take this kind of uh, state transition uh, like a state uh, get 2 transition one from the previous state S i on condition i and SJ there is a self loop which is condition J. So, the DJ uh, because this is nothing but the SJ uh, DJ corresponding to this state J is nothing but condition I and SI, but SI is just a single flip flop. So, we will say it is QI or condition J which is composed of first case 5 input uh, and QJ because this state is represented by a single flip flop q ok q j. So, you have the worst case 5 inputs specifying this input condition and 2 inputs for q i and q j. So, you have 7 input next state logic which require only maybe 2 CLB uh, which is less spread and then we have um, less logic delay and the timing the clock frequency becomes you know manageable ok that is the idea of one hot encoding. Uh, so, there is many a times um, people blindly like when you see FPGA um, you just say ok let the state machine be one hot encoded it is not required you know. So, suppose you have a 4 state state machine with 2 input and 2 output absolutely there is no need to go for one hot encoding because uh, this can be encoded using 2 flip flops 
and with two input the next state logic can go in one lookup table for for a particular flip flop and there is absolutely no need of going for one out encoding. So, but when the uh, number of states are more number of inputs are more then you can go for one out encoding which eats up the flip flop but the timing becomes better which definitely is at the cost of extra flip flops uh, but the timing is better. So, this can be kind of um, control using some kind of attribute in VHDL code. Um, you can have a state encoding like sequential which is binary uh, like the state 0 will have the 0 0 state 1 is kind of 1 and the gray is a gray code. And this is the 1 out 1 and 1 out 0 which is which is a, a single flip flop uh, for a for a particular state you know that is what is uh, 1 out 1 and 1 out 0. And this can be controlled using some attributes um, like such like saying suppose you can say suppose you have defined a state type uh, called you know enumerated uh, state type called state type you can say attribute state encoding of state type you can say type is gray or 1 out 1, 1 out 0 and things like that. Or you can even specify attribute enum encoding of state type type is you can say S0 is this, S1 is this, S2 is this, S3 is this you can literally specify the state encoding ok. And now this is the vendor dependent this is not a part of the VHDL this is a user defined attribute. So, you have to, to refer to the vendor tool manual whether they support it ok. So, um, we are coming to the end of the, um, the lecture. So, I will I will complete this part in the next lecture maybe another 15 minutes I will be able to complete the FPGA part. Then we will look at some remaining uh, the VHDL part. So, today basically we have completed uh, the configuration we have looked at uh, what is implemented in the current FPGA in terms of the configuration. We have looked at the bitstream compression, uh, bitstream encryption, multi boot then we have looked at um, uh, this uh, one hot encoding where um, the next state logic complexity can be reduced. So, that uh, the state machine works with uh, at a faster clock uh, so that the data path it is in sync with the data path and that uh, one hot encoding can be controlled using some attributes uh, that is what is we have uh, discussed today and what is remaining is very minimal we will look at uh, the complete this part and we will look at some FPGAs from other vendors very briefly uh, one from the Altera and one from the Actel and wind it up. Please review the, the portions I have covered uh, so that you are in sync and I wish you all the best and thank you.